today's topic, if you can see my screen, is the nuts and bolts of coalition work. We are going to have a number of presenters today. Kim Linkle, she's the director for Coalition for a Drug-Free Batesville. She is on the CADCA Coalition Development Team and has done a number of presentations with them. Michael Ross, as you know, is the director of the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute Behavioral Health Division. And I'm getting, oh, he's waving to say, hey, I thought I was doing something wrong there. Okay. And then Sadia is our program manager also for ICJI. And later in the program, they will share what's happening from their point of view. So Kim, while you set up to share your screens, I'm going to let everybody know a little bit about you, okay? So Kim is the director of the Coalition for a Drug-Free Batesville in Batesville, Indiana, and is part of the CADCA Coalition Develop Development Team. She has over 20 years of experience in coalition development, specifically focusing on substance abuse prevention. She holds a master's degree in leadership development from St. Mary of the Woods College. And over the years, Kim has held a variety of positions working with coalitions, both locally, regionally, and statewide. Her experience is concentrated on coaching both drug-free community grantees, as well as community coalitions. Kim is driven by assisting coalitions in creating community-wide change to improve their community one change at a time. She enjoys seeing people come together to work on improving their community by focusing on a common goal. So Kim, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you so much, Bobby. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to preface everything by saying I was having some computer issues. So if I freeze up or something, I apologize. Um, I'm just excited that I was able to get on the Zoom meeting and have um, my PowerPoint up. So um, thank you everyone for attending. And like Bobby mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of coalition work, um, specifically for newcomers, but even for those of you who have been in the coalition world, um, working with LCCs for a long time, because a lot of times things can get mundane. Obviously, over the last 15, 16 months, we've been living in the, you know, COVID era. Um, and so as we come out of this, I feel like many of us just need to be reminded of things that we should um, and could be doing um, as coalition leaders. So we're going to go ahead and get started. If you can answer yes to any of the following, you're probably um, going to hopefully learn at least one new thing today, a takeaway. Um, so if you feel some days I'm extremely busy, but all I, but I feel like I hardly accomplish anything. I have spent some days just responding to endless email threads. I haven't met one on one with each and every coalition member. I haven't seen our logic models, action plans, evaluation plan, or sustainability plan. I don't know all of my funding sources or my budgets, or I can't list and or articulate the steps of the SPF. I'm sure all of you already know what the SPF stands for. It's the Strategic Prevention Framework. I know in the coalition field, I feel like we all talk in acronyms all the time. So I'm going to do my best today to not use acronyms. However, if I do, and you have a question like, hey, what does this mean? Absolutely put that in the chat so that we can, um, I can make sure that I address that um, immediately. So if you can answer yes to any of the following you know, it's just a reminder that coalition leaders are busy, we have a lot going on, and we can spend our days feeling like, you know, we get to mark three things off of our to-do list, but then we add five things, so we almost go backwards. Um, and so that's really what I just want to talk to everyone today a little bit about. In addition to the roles of coalition leaders, um, coordinators, directors, versus the members who are more in that volunteer role. I believe it is a true balancing act. We have administrative acts as coalition staff. We have ongoing training and education, not only of ourselves, but ensuring that we're offering those opportunities to members. And 
we're continually building relationships. I know many times I feel like that's all I get done. However, that is such an important and vital part of the coalition work that we do, that it is important and should take up a vast majority of our time, as well as the coalition work and duties. So by that, I mean, you know, implementing strategies, doing programming, if you're a coalition or an LCC that does programming, determining your strategic action plan, you know, what you are going to do over the next year, the next three years. So it, in addition to all the, those previously three mentioned things, we also have all that additional coalition work to do. So it's a true balancing act. And I love the picture about multitasking because I feel like on a regular basis, I multitask every day, all day long, as I am sure most of you do as well. So now I wanna roll in a little bit to the role of a coalition staff, and then we'll talk about coalition members next. So really I see as a leader, coordinator, director of the coalition, more as a convener. You're not always doing those every day, maybe events out in the community. You know, hopefully you have members that are willing to step up and do a lot of the action and do that, that type of work, but you're convening the group. You're bringing them together. You're sending out the information about upcoming meetings. You're working to make sure that your action plan for the year, you know, is being met and you're helping remind the members and your if you have an executive committee, if you have a leadership team, um, or even if you um, if you're organized, just that you know that the whole coalition or the whole LCC comes together to make decisions, you're that person that really brings them together. Many times, you're also serving in that role as a facilitator. Sometimes the coalition staff does end up facilitating either the coalition meeting or you know if you have. Um, committee meetings or other types of meetings, you are that facilitator. Hopefully you have a president or a chair, whatever that role may be that would actually run the meetings. But sometimes, unfortunately, that role does fall on us as coalition staff. Many times also when where I see us as coalition leaders um, serving in that facilitation role is specifically with the youth component. So if you have a youth coalition or a youth committee, many times those youth just need someone to guide them, not really to you know, tell them what to do and give them directive, but to really guide them because they're learning, you know, they are still young um, and learning the process of how organizations work. And so they really need someone to help facilitate that work and to continue to drive them forward. Also, as a coalition staff member, we're overseeing and managing those day-to-day -day operations. I know, you know, the as an LCC coordinator or coalition director, you have your, you know, community comprehensive plans to do. If you are a drug-free community funded coalition, you have your, you know, all of the work that comes along with being a drug-free community fund um, recipient. Um, you know, Division of Mental Health and Addictions has some funding that comes out. So you're really overseeing and managing those day-to-day -day operations. And many times that is where we can sometimes get bogged down. And I know I mentioned in the, in the initial slide about, you know, emails and feeling like that's all you get done every day. So I encourage you as a coalition staff member to just carve out maybe 10 minutes at the end of an hour or you know, an hour in the morning, an hour after lunch to really answer those emails and to set that aside because I know that if my email is opened all the time, I can get really bogged down with it and feel like I can't get anything else done because I'm gonna to respond to that right away. So you know, just overseeing and managing those day-to-day -day operations can be a lot for us as coalition leaders. You also assist the coalition in the assessment, the planning, the implementation, and evaluation. So really all pieces of that strategic prevention framework. And if you notice here, I always like to emphasize the word assist. 
Um, you shouldn't be doing the assessment, the planning, the implementation, the evaluation, but truly working with the coalition members to make sure that those pieces are in place and that you're continuing to move forward. Obviously, you want to make sure you're keeping the coalition and the committees focused when you bring key community leaders together from across the county, everyone comes with wonderful ideas and, um, you know, the amazing thoughts. And, you know, depending which organization they're representing, if they're coming there for work, you know, they're, they have um, ideas and thoughts of what would work best for their organization, or even personally, people have thoughts and ideas. And so really, as a, as a staff member, you would want to keep them at, you know, to help them stay focused because it's easy to get, you know, derailed and start talking about something else and you leave the meeting and you're like, wait a minute, we didn't even get to where we needed to go. So I see that as another vital role of the staff is to really keep the coalition and committee focused on what, whichever action you're working on at that time. And then also, be the subject matter expert for the coalition, whether that's internal or external. So many times, you know, the coalition members may have questions. If you as a staff member don't have that information or don't, you know, readily have that answer, go find that for them, you know, become that subject matter expert so that you can, you know, ans answer the questions that the coalition members have and even the community members, because over time, you know, you may have a school um, principal reach out to you and ask you a question about, you know, something alcohol, tobacco and other drug related or, you know, hey, is this a new trend or what trends are you seeing or things like that. So the more you as a staff member can, you know, attend webinars, attend trainings and really know the trends that are going on both locally, statewide and nationally, the better off you're going to be positioned to really be that subject matter expert for the coalition. I feel that there's so much data that we can truly have in our heads um, at once, but I know that's one thing I try to do really hard in our community is kind of know those big data points that a lot of people, I feel a lot of people may ask us about. Like I know over time people say, do we still have a lot of youth, you know, that are drinking? Well, obviously, so that's one data point I want to keep in the back of my head so that I have that readily available. Now, many times if they're like, hey, you know, how, what percentage of sixth graders reported that they were, you know, used alcohol in the last 30 days or, you know, as we're in a coalition meeting, obviously, I also may not have that number specific, but I know where to go get that at. So, you know, as that coalition staff member, always be ready to answer questions when you can, and then obviously have that information available if you don't have that, you know, right there on the tip of your tongue to share. Next thing I would like to talk about is the role of coalition members. And so I really see the role of the coalition members as really driving the work of the coalition. So the staff member is more in the background, helping navigate the systems, making sure there's funding to be able to do the programs, the initiatives, the strategies, the environmental um, changes that you wanna make, but really planning and setting those priorities should be up to the coalition members that come to the table each and every month. And so it's vital to have a good group of different sectors at the table so that you can get everyone's input and you can really know what's going on in your community to make those changes. They also need to be the drivers in defining the role of the coalition. You know, it's easy for coalitions to get um, derailed or like shifted based on funding opportunities. And I would really encourage all of you as you are seeking additional funding or looking for new opportunities to really know what the role of your coalition is. Some coalitions do um, focus on other areas besides just substance misuse. They may focus on um, suicide prevention or um, some, you know, do a lot of work around the 40 developmental assets. So 
it's okay to have those other areas of priorities and focus, but really make sure you know as a group what that role, you know, what that the definition of what your focus areas are. You know, so if a funding opportunity comes up, you can right away know, yes, we're going to go after this or no, we're not, because that's really not what we define as the role of our coalition. Also, you want the coalition members to be highly involved in that assessment, the strategic planning, and the evaluation. And I know many times as staff, it's easy just to say, you know what, I, I don't seem to be able to get anyone interested or involved, you know, involved or willing to help out. And so we're going to go ahead and do, you know, I'm just going to move forward. But that's really not the role of the staff. That's really what the coalition members can be. Many times you don't have to have every member helping with assessment, every member helping with strategic planning. Find those that are interested in that. Find those members, you know, maybe it's a small team. So maybe you create an action committee, or maybe you have just a group that says, you know what, we would help work on that assessment. So we would help pull that data together. We would help, you know, really define what the community looks like. Same with strategic planning. It may be that same group that's interested in that, but you may have other members that say, you know what, I'm interested in that strategic planning. So really, having members' voices help with and drive the work uh, when it comes to that assessment, the strategic planning, and, and the evaluation. I know one thing that we do locally is we have a data team, and it's made up of four or five of our members. And anytime we get a new set of Indiana Youth Survey data, we do an annual community perception survey. So when we get that data back, that team, that team I send the information to. So they really look into that information a lot deeper than maybe the rest of the coalition members. We share the information with everyone, but not everyone wants to, you know, really do that deeper dive into that evaluation to see what it looks like. And so just having those members look at that and really do that deeper dive helps them not only become more engaged, but invested in the entire process because they then they start asking those questions like, did you notice that, you know, vaping has really gone up in this grade or what happened in, you know, the junior high level or the senior high level this year that has caused, you know, the shift in usage. So by having them truly engaged in the process will really help them become more active and invested members. They should always be part of all of the decision making of the coalition. So as you know, the coalition is moving forward and working on their action plan and implementing strategies, make sure that, you know, that is where the coalition truly wants to go. And that's, you know, they're involved in those decisions. Encourage them to attend coalition meetings when possible. We know things come up. We know people can't be there all the time, but encourage them to attend when they can. And then the last piece, which is probably the most important piece, is to be part of that implementation of those strategies. So if you're working on implementing a new policy or if you're changing a local ordinance, make sure that the members are involved in that because that really is what will get them to buy in to the overall work. You know, a year, two years down the road, they can say, hey, I was a part of that. I helped, you know make those parks tobacco and vape free, or I helped implement this policy at the school. So it just creates that additional buy-in when they are part of the implementation process and really helping with those strategies. I know one thing many coalitions like to do is to um, do, many people call it tabling. So they'll set up a booth at a health fair or an event, community event. Make sure that it's not just you as a staff member attending those, you know, events and having information, but make sure there, there's a member there also, because if someone comes up and has some questions about being a member, that member is going to be able to answer that a lot better than you as a staff member can, because they are a member and they know kind of what their role and responsibility currently is.
And some things to know about roles. I'm a big believer, believer in that people own what they build. So involve the members in the planning and by, by involving the members in the planning and determining the strategies, if they are part of building that strategy or that initiative or that program, they are going to own it because they were part of that. I also think it's important to break down the tasks. You know, if we just simply as coalition staff say, hey, we need something done that's a huge task. Many times people are like, wait a minute, like, do I really want to take this task on. However, if we break those tasks down and we can say, hey, Joe, can you please, you know, reach out to, you know, the chief of police and ask them about this because I know you're good friends with them. Well, that's much easier for them to do than if we say, hey, can you oversee this whole event or can you do this huge task? So really make the tasks more manageable because people are much more likely to volunteer and be willing to do tasks when they're much smaller bite-sized tasks. And then I know that one thing that I have learned over the last 15 months is to really meet the members where they are and understand their interest and engagement level and be flexible. Many of you have key leaders in your communities that sit on your LCCs, that sit on your coalitions, and during the pandemic, it has been very challenging for many of them to come to the table. We're very blessed in our community, and our mayor is on our executive committee. Well, you know, last March, April, May, when COVID hit, our mayor had a few more things to worry about than the coalition on a daily basis, and so we know that you know, we as a coalition needed to understand that he may need to be away for, you know, a little bit and not as active in the coalition because of what was going on. Same thing with school personnel. You know, obviously the superintendents, the principals, they had a lot going um, on last year and a lot on their plates when COVID hit. And so we as a coalition had to understand that sometimes the coalition isn't their top priority or isn't even in the top five items of their priority list at that point. You know, so be flexible, meet them where they are, understand that they may still be very interested and want to be engaged, but just the time and what they're dealing with either in their personal life or their professional life doesn't allow that. And just be flexible. You know, I'm a big, big, I really feel that communication is key. So I know we um, continue to just have paper meetings for a few months when it first hit, just because we knew that so many members weren't going to be able to attend uh, meetings. So we would just send updates. Our executive committee met, but we as a coalition did not meet for a few months right after the pandemic hit. Then finally, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about community building and engagement basics. So I know I just mentioned to be flexible, and that's important in all aspects, not just coalition work, but I just feel like we need to be flexible. Think, you know, people change positions, people's lives change, their kids grow up, they start having children, and so they may not be able to be more engaged. Their role within their work may change. So we just need to be flexible and understand that form follows function. So always just know that, you know, if to if we want to get to the end point to continue to follow that process and we will get there um, again, that recruiting to tasks and not meeting meetings. There are, you know, many times that we have people that are engaged in the coalition and the process, but may not be able to make a meeting for whatever prop, you know, reason. Maybe there, I know um, our prosecutor always reaches out and says, hey, I have court on Monday. We're not going to, I'm not going to be able to be at the meeting, but please let me know what happens and if there's anything I can do before next month. So it's not necessarily that he doesn't want to be involved, but he's just unable to many times attend the meeting. So again, if there's something specific that we're working on that I know we can involve him in, I could reach out to him for that, even though he's not at the meeting. I think it's also important to continually ask for feedback and input. I know I was on a call this morning with a coalition and they had shared 
we were talking about when they were going to go back to in-person meetings and they um, had done a kind of a quick, just short survey to ask their members, are you ready to go back into person? Where are you at? And so definitely, you know, asking for continually asking for that feedback and input from the coalition members really lets them know that you want them there and that you truly care about their thoughts and opinions and everything that's going on, you know, with them personally. Also, as you're, you know, implementing strategies, have those feedback sessions. How did this go? How did this work? Talk about that, walk through that, because maybe, you know, a member has a great idea or a way to think about it differently that we, you know, didn't think about. So always ask for that feedback and input. And then, you know, just listen, validate and include, you know, go from that but to, you know, yeah, but to yes, and um, is really important because if we listen to our members and we validate what they're saying and include them, they're much more likely to become, you know, long-term members of the coalition. I know um, one community, there was a member that said that they were seeing a resurgent of um, the use of spice in their um, community. And so they were asking some questions during a coalition meeting. And so the leadership team was able to bring in um, a, a training on spice. So that, you know, really showed that community member who comes to the table on a regular basis that they, you know, we, the leadership team was listening to them and they, you know, knew that that was a concern of people in their community. And so they were able to provide that training. So again, by the members knowing that you're listening and validating what they're saying, many times just brings in that additional level of engagement. And then some additional um, community engagement basics, be specific and time sensitive in your request. I know it's so easy for us to say, hey, can you give, you know, the superintendent a call and talk to them about X, Y, and Z? But if we can say, hey, I need to know this by next Friday, would you be able to call the superintendent and ask him, you know, and have three specific questions that we need to ask? That's much more um focused and a co coalition member is more likely to say, yeah, you know what, I can do that for you because it, you know, they see it as a 10 or 15 minute call that they're going to make and they know exactly what they're going to do. Also celebrate a sector a month as a drug-free community grantee. Obviously there are 12 sectors that are required to be around the table. So by celebrating a sector a month, each person is celebrated at least once a year. Um, and then also I encourage people during that time. So I'm just going to say it's the months to celebrate law enforcement, not only celebrate those law enforcement officers that are at the table and involved in the coalition, but also take that opportunity to spend a few minutes just saying, hey, is there any other law enforcement agencies or representatives that should be here? Who else could we bring to the table? So it's a way on an annual basis to really talk about each one of those sectors. And it's a way to just continue to bring new members to the table. And again, to get input from the whole coalition. Um, I know one thing that we have done is if someone says, oh, I think you know, this person or this agency should be at the table, we will simply ask, do you know someone there that you could reach out to? Or do you, you know, do you have a connection? And if they don't, then open it up to the entire coalition, because maybe another member has, you know, a connection, maybe they're related to someone that works there, maybe they know that person, maybe they're a friend. So, you know, be to be able to make that more personal ask. Seek out ways to help your members. And I think that's um, very important. You know, I know sometimes you think, why am I sitting at this reality fair? Or why am I sitting, you know, doing this? Well, sometimes we as coalition leaders need to step outside of our box also and help the, our partners do something that may not be 100% in alignment with the 
actions that we are doing right now and strategies. But obviously, you know, they're being part of our coalition and they're invested in us. So we also need to, you know, be willing and able to help them and make sure that their um, objectives and their goals are being met as well. Develop a new member onboarding process um, and meet prior to a coalition meeting. I try, I encourage coalitions to, if they know a new member is coming to the table next month or on a certain month, to meet with that member, if at all possible, before the meeting. Um, and the reason that I encourage you to do this is so you can just answer any questions and kind of find out their why before they're at the table. I've seen way too many times a new member come to the table and they sit there for a meeting, they really don't say much, and then you never see them again. Um, and so if you know someone's coming, I encourage you to meet with them to kind of find out their why, what their interests are, where they heard you know, about the coalition at before so you can kind of prep them you know with some of the strategies some of the action steps that you guys are working on if someone just shows up at the meeting which i'm sure happens you know a lot it i encourage either you as the coalition staff or um if you have a leadership team or an executive committee maybe one or two of those people would be willing to just stop that new person immediately after the meeting to just check in, you know, thank them for coming, see if they have any questions. Because again, we all know that we talk in acronyms. And if you have, you know, there's going to be strategies and action that you guys may have had on the agenda for three or four months that now they're just coming in and into the middle of it. And so maybe they don't have that history and that background. So I think um, by having that onboarding process and determining, you know, if a new member comes, who's going to talk to them after the meeting, um, who's going to follow up with them, or who's going to meet with them before the meeting to really welcome them and make sure that they know, you know, that their voice is wanted at the table and, you know, that the meeting is open to everyone. Kim, this um, is so good. And I, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We've got nope. 10 minutes left on our meeting. Okay. And we, we did have a question come through on the chat okay. and I want to okay. give other people a chance to ask you a question, really get into your head and pull that information out. And um, one of the questions was, how are you celebrating a sector? What, what are you doing? What's the party? So what, so what we have been able to do is, so we purchase an item obviously for the year. So one year we did the nice golf umbrellas with our logo on it. So when it was your month to be ce celebrated, so if it was um, the youth organization, so all of the youth organization members that were at the table got that item that day. We thank them for coming. I think there's so much more we could be doing, like putting it out on social media and really making a much bigger deal. We haven't necessarily gone there yet, but so, and then, so not only are they getting a small token of our appreciation, for example, the golf umbrella, one year we did like the Yeti cups with our logo on it, but by the end of the year, every coalition member has that item. Um, so they know they're going to get it. And then if we have extra items, then we'll use those, you know, for it as community organizations reach out to us for giveaways and things like that. So that's how we celebrate them. Um, I, like I said, there, there are so many ways we could celebrate. That's just what we have done. Um, that personal thank you. And then a small token of our appreciation for them being there. Great, thank you. Okay, um, just so we can keep moving and take advantage of Kim's time, is there anyone else who wants to unmute and ask a question or go ahead and put it in the chat? We'll just take another maybe a minute or two before we turn it over to ICJI. Yeah, and I was going to say, Bobby, my email's on there. So if anyone does have any follow-up questions, they can feel free to send me an email um, and I will get back with them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You've definitely given us all a lot to think about um, and maybe some different ways of approaching our coalition to make sure that foundation is really strong and represented well. 
Thank you. Thanks, Kim. So Michael and Sadia, we're going to turn the floor over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I can't tell you how, how happy that this meeting makes me. Um, about a year and a half ago, maybe it was Lord two years ago at this point, when we sat down and, and had initial conversations about um, what this might look like, this was my hope that, that the ICN would really serve as a peer-to-peer um, coaching collaborative environment where resources could be shared, knowledge could be shared. Um, you all could learn from each other um, because you all are truly the experts on your local coalitions. And right, you all know there are some similarities, but you all have vast differences across the state with resources or partnerships. And Kim, that was just absolutely fantastic. So, so thank you for sharing it. Um, I dropped in the chat box um, because you just reminded me of it. Uh, the strategic, strategic prevention framework training uh, webinar that we had from our Great Lakes Technology Transfer Center workshop that we had uh, for people last year. Um, if you were unable to attend or you've forgotten what the strategic prevention framework is, please feel free to go ahead and navigate there. Um, in addition, on our website, um, and I'll screen share really quick. All right, now nah, I won't. I'll, I'll just uh, explain it. So we've updated our website. Um, so if you go to the behavioral health division section of our website, um, there are going to be a tremendous amount of curated resources now for you all. There will also be the last two annual surveys uh, that we sent out. So if you haven't read those, please go there. There's also the infographic for um, the LCCs from last year that we presented to the Commission to Combat Drug Abuse. Um, and, and I just have to say, you know, we, we so much appreciate everybody's effort with the updated comprehensive community plan uh, and the survey this year. We had a decrease in, in respondents to the survey, but it was still over 50%, which is a success when it comes to survey results. So thank you there. Um, we continue to use those to inform us. Uh, and we will continue to make modest adjustments and we will be putting together an advisory council of LCC leadership. So we'll be sending out a survey in the coming weeks, probably about a month and a half, uh, asking who would be interested in serving on an advisory board for us of the local coordinating council. So as we make adjustments to policy, um, as we make adjustments to, you know, if should we ever make adjustments to the comprehensive community plan or anything else, that way we can take into account the advice of you all. Um, in addition, uh, we continue to encourage you all to look at the state epidemiological outcome uh, work group report, and I'll post that in the chat here. Uh, it is a tremendous source of data for all of you throughout the state. Um, and the final thing I'll say before I turn it over to Sadia is, uh, you know, part of our reason for updating the comprehensive community plan and moving to a, a point in time for you all to be able to submit to us was so that we could more accurately understand what's happening at the local level. And this was the first year that we had two sets of data. Uh, so we were able to look at LCC funding across the year. Um, and so what we saw is fee deposits uh, did go down from 4,658,000 to 3,942,000 uh, between 2020 and 2021. Um, anecdotally, we could suspect that that might be related to the pandemic, but it's hard to say. I know many of you have experienced this and have expressed to us that you wanted to understand that. We're like, like we said, we're continuing to look into this, um, but this analysis is, is the start of that. Uh, and we're able to see amount of carryover from year to year. So the, the rollover funds uh, from 2020 were 1,304,000 and then in uh, 2021, so in the CCP we just received, it was 1,484,000. So, so we typically see um, rollover. So, so despite funds decreasing, that there is a struggle sometimes to fully award. Now this is the average and that's not representative of everybody because some people might fully award and others may struggle. Um, but this is allowing us to be able to sort of have those analytical conversations, see where we can provide technical assistance, see if any of the processes need improvement or if statutory language needs revised. Uh, so we just deeply appreciate you all taking the CCP seriously. Um, and, and we hope that it continues to, to be a benefit, um, that it's a living document now. But just thank you, everyone. And, and we'll have more information to share, I hope, next month or the month after on on 
our analysis of the CCP and, and the survey results. Good afternoon, all. Um, before giving an update, I would like to thank all of you um, for submitting CCP and end of the year reports on time. I would also like to thank all of you for waiting patiently for approval letters. It took us a little longer um, to finish the approval this year because of the adjustment we have to make regarding some CCPs. Um, I have just four important things for uh, you guys. Um, as far as the CCP review is concerned, we have completed review for all counties. Most of you must have received an approval letters by now. Um, and those who have not received it yet, uh, they will receive approval sometimes by next week. Uh, second, uh, end of the year report, we have completed an initial review for the end of the year report for all counties. And we have sent modification requests to those who have failed to submit complete and correct reports. Um, those who have received approval notification will get feedback from me or Corey uh, sometime in the next few weeks. Um, we have hired a new research assistant, Andrea, who is working on the um, LCCA annual survey result. Uh, the report will be ready once the results are compiled. Uh, in the last, I would like to remind all of you about our collaboration with the DMHA. Um, I want to let you know that both agencies are working together uh, to strengthen the prevention efforts at the local level. Some, you, uh, some of you have reached out to us um, regarding the regional prevention framework um, and the MHA presented information in the last webinar. If you have any question regarding their process, please feel free to reach out to me or Corey and we will be happy to connect you with someone in the MHA. Um, and that's all from my side. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So we know it is <clears throat> just a little bit after 1245. So if anyone has announcements, are there things happening in your area that you want to let everybody know about, please share it at this time. Okay, I know here in Scott County on June 3rd from noon to one o'clock, we have our monthly CEASE meeting and we have a presentation by um, Sam that's going to talk about the impact that legalizing marijuana has on a state, a community, looking at it from a financial and a social and a business aspect. So we're excited. Um, that is posted on the ICN website under the event tab. So if you would like to jump on and watch that, you're more than welcome to. Anyone else have anything going on? All right, very good. So next month, um, we are going to be talking with um, an LCC who has excellent relationships with their school systems. So we can really dig in and understand how they got that, how they're maintaining it, and maybe come up with some ideas of um, how we can continue to improve our relationships. So we hope to see you then. We will definitely share those links with you. It is the same Zoom link. So if you've got the one from today, you can just copy it over to next month if you haven't done so. Thank you very much for joining us today. We will see you next month.